On this day, five years ago, a massive earthquake and tsunami hit northeastern Japan. This afternoon, people from around the country will gather for memorial ceremonies and observe a moment of silent prayer at 2.46, the exact time when the quake struck. The magnitude 9 quake in 2011 was the largest in Japan's recorded history. Huge waves ravaged communities on the country's Pacific coast. Nearly 16,000 people died in the disaster, and after five years, more than 2,500 are still missing. The Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant experienced a triple meltdown, which spread highly radioactive materials over a wide area. The accident was one of the worst in history. Residents of northeastern Japan are remembering that tragic day, and they're paying tribute to lost friends and loved ones. More than 700 people died when the tsunami swept over the Yuriage district of Natori. Members of the community came together to mourn the victims. Some of my relatives and many of my neighbors died. I came here to pray that they rest in peace. In Otsuchi, the tsunami engulfed the town hall, killing 40 local officials, including the mayor at the time. The town lost about one-third of its municipal workforce. Officials gathered there to remember the dead and contemplate the future. We will hand down the thoughts of those who died to make our hometown once more a place where people can live safely. We will move forward strongly to rebuild our town. Police officers and firefighters still look for signs of the missing along the coast of Fukushima Prefecture, where 197 people are listed as missing. Piles of debris once littered the landscape, preventing a thorough search, and high levels of radiation stood in the way of cleaning it up. The last of the rubble was cleared away this month, and today, around 500 people came to join the search. I'm determined to locate as many missing people as possible and send what I find back to their families. On March 11, 2011, a massive earthquake and tsunami hit northeastern Japan. It triggered one of the worst nuclear accidents in history at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. This week, our series, Journey from Disaster, will look at the region and its people five years on. Cleaning up the plant is generating a serious problem of its own. Huge quantities of contaminated water are affecting people around. The issue is affecting the livelihood of people who depend on the sea as well. NHK World's Takafumi Terui reports. Twice a week, fishermen from the city of Iwaki head out into Fukushima's coastal waters. Their port is 40 kilometers from the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. We only handle products that have passed screening. They're safe and we hope people enjoy eating them. The fishermen conduct strict checks on the concentration of radioactive substances in each catch. They've set their own standard of 50 burkles per kilogram. That's even stricter than the national standard said to be the toughest in the world. This area was once renowned for offering one of the best catches around Japan. But five years has not been enough time for fishermen to restore that reputation. The problem is the water. People cannot be sure if it's as clean as it was before the nuclear accident. The operator of the Fukushima Daiichi plant, Tokyo Electric Power Company, is struggling to control water contaminated with radioactive materials. Workers at the plant must keep the molten fuel at the plant cool. That requires injecting enormous quantities of water. 
and the volume increases as groundwater seeps into the plant. Huge amounts of contaminated water are being generated. Workers are pumping out the water. But since they cannot remove all the radioactive substances it contains, they have to store it in tanks on site. About 800,000 tons of water are now being stored. TEPCO officials are trying to limit the volume by keeping groundwater away from the reactor buildings. In May 2014, they started pumping it up before it could reach the buildings and releasing it into the ocean. They've also been working on measures to keep contaminated water from flowing into the sea. They installed a steel wall near the shore last year. Now the government and TEPCO officials are planning to build another wall made of ice. Pipes surrounding the reactor buildings descend 30 meters into the ground. Cooling liquid will be circulated through the pipes to freeze the soil around them. If all goes well, the result will be a huge 1.5 kilometer long wall of ice. But some people doubt the $300 million system will work. Satoshi Sato is a nuclear engineer. The frozen soil will melt if it's left on its own. This is just a temporary measure. It could melt one day. What will they do if some parts don't freeze? Ideally, it should be a solid wall that lasts a long time. A TEPCO official responsible for decommissioning the plant says they're making progress. We recognize there are concerns about using the ice wall in the long term, so we'll monitor it closely. We've implemented measures to respond to the contaminated water issue, and the ice wall is just one of them. We're working on a comprehensive approach. The fishermen of Fukushima are also keeping a close eye on the situation. They desperately hope it will be resolved as soon as possible so they can resume their former way of life out on the sea. Takahumi Terui, NHK World, Iwaki, Fukushima. On March 11, 2011, a massive earthquake and tsunami hit northeastern Japan. It triggered one of the worst nuclear accidents in history at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. Our series Journey from Disaster is looking at the region and its people five years on. The nuclear disaster spread massive amounts of radioactive materials far and wide. The government has been working to reduce radiation exposure, but people are still concerned. One scientist has been assessing the scope of the radiation problem. NHK World's Mitsuko Nishikawa reports. Yugo Hayano analyzes if there's any radioactive materials on the food. He's an expert in nuclear physics. He was working with high school students from Japan and overseas. Uh, we have uh, confirmed that the, the, the peach that we enjoyed today didn't contain cesium. Detectable level. What Hayano has been trying to check okay, so is the level now, of internal exposure uh, in Fukushima. Internal exposure occurs when people ingest radioactive materials. They may cause cancer or other diseases. Knowing the Japanese government hasn't done much about internal exposure, he voluntarily started checking for it. Over the past five years, he has examined about 50,000 people. Two years after the accident, Kuniko Usui, a resident of Fukushima, brought her two-year-old daughter to Hayano. After the accident, Usui was worried about her daughter's health. Hayano found no signs of internal exposure. We were just terribly afraid. Although I imagined the worst, I was able to understand what was happening thanks to Hayano's prompt action. I was so relieved to find nothing was wrong. I was so happy. I was almost crying. Hayano knew there were no devices that could measure radiation in newborn babies. 
so he developed one himself. He tested more than 5,000 children. We found nobody who had a detectable level of radio scission. He wants to know more about another effect of the radiation. It's radioactive iodine, which can cause thyroid cancer, especially in children. Hayano thinks it's important to discuss these matters with local youth. He brought a Spanish expert who investigated the correlation between the Chernobyl accident and thyroid cancer. Students asked her if there is any similarity between Chernobyl and Fukushima. Right now you can't say anything about increase in Fukushima. Right now you can say screening. Maybe in the future screening continues and if the rates go up, then maybe you could say there is an effect of radiation. In these five years, not just our data, but other data as well, have shown that the radiation risks to people, uh, both external and internal, uh, in Fukushima, in the region where people are allowed to live, are low enough. And uh, uh, my work, of course, has uh, contributed to this, and that's my pleasure that I, I had a chance to work on this. Hayano thinks his research alone is not the final answer to solve multiple issues in the future for people in Fukushima. He says it's important to keep monitoring everyone's health and to share the information with people there. Mitsuko Nishikawa, NHK World, Fukushima. Now we go to Fukushima's Tomioka town, located about nine kilometers south of the crippled plant. It straddles the evacuation zones. NHK World's Yoichiro Tateiwa visited the town and reports on its situation. This place is actually, we can come here, but no one is allowed to live here. And as you can see there, you know, massive tsunami hit the area. And the house over there, the walls are all torn down. And you can see through it. And that's what happened five years ago. And it still existed as it was. And all this, you know, is the center of the town. And there were the hotels, the shops are around. But as you can see, reconstruction has just started. And you don't see anything here. And where we stand is the railway station. That was the main place of the town. So, that, you know, this is the main transportation for everybody around here, but not in use. And you can see the track, the weeds are all over. The contamination work is we take all this debris or the grass or all the things uh, contaminated with the radioactive particles uh, take out. But there's another problem, you know, those waste has to be stored in somewhere else. And the, as you can see, the, the black bags over there, that's what they fill with waste, with radioactive particles. So it has to do with this because the volume of this waste is so big, so, so large. So we have to minimize the volume. And if you go through it, if you see this white building inside, that's where the process is going on, and that's where those waste are going. Inside, there are huge amounts of debris, the byproduct of the contamination work. Everything in here is radioactive garbage from the region. The facility started operations last May, and it runs around the clock, 24 hours a day. They pick up a load of waste and take it over to be burned. As you can see, this building is pressurized, so that the pressure inside the building is lower than outside. The aim is that they want to contain any of those radioactive particles inside the building. The debris is incinerated at 10,000 degrees Celsius. It's reduced to ashes. Its volume, only 20% of the original lore. As for the emissions, workers here say they use filters 
to prevent any contaminated particles from being released into the environment. The ashes from the fire are still radioactive, so they will be stored at this facility for the time being. The government is currently building a temporary storage facility. There is no set date for its construction to be finished. Once all the debris is clear and the decontamination work is finished, the next part of the process can start, the process of rebuilding. Meanwhile, about nine kilometers from here, there is a much longer process underway. And unless we safely decommission the crippled Fukushima Daiichi plant, the area of revival will not happen. Yoichiro Tateiwa, NHK World, Tomioka, Fukushima. The operator of the crippled Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant carried out a survey last year that shed new light on the accident. Tokyo Electric Power Company, or TEPCO, revealed the status of a backup cooling system was not shared by workers at the time of the 2011 disaster. Meltdowns took place at three of the plant's reactors, starting with the number one unit. The complete loss of power shut down the normal cooling systems. Surveys by the government, the Diet and TEPCO took place during the year after the accident. They revealed that staff did not know whether an emergency cooling system was functioning. All indicator lamps went off following the loss of power. But different findings were obtained in a survey carried out last year by TEPCO. One worker said he stopped the emergency cooling system just before the loss of power. Another said he thought the system was not functioning after the power went out because pressure inside the reactor was rising. The manager on duty said he had no memory of being informed that the complete loss of power had shut down the backup cooling system. TEPCO officials say workers may have failed to share important information on the status of the backup cooling system amid confusion over the loss Researchers of Researchers at Japan's nuclear regulator have released new findings about radiation levels within an 80-kilometer radius of the crippled Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. They say the levels fell by an average of 65 percent over four years. The Nuclear Regulation Authority periodically monitors air dose rates by using helicopters 300 meters above the ground. The detected values are then converted to show what the rate is one meter above the ground. The agency first conducted a survey in October 2011, seven months after the accident. At that time, yellow and red areas with radiation measuring over 3.8 microsieverts per hour extended toward the northwest beyond a 30-kilometer radius around the plant. Radiation of 3.8 microsieverts per hour converts to 20 millisieverts per year. That is the target level required before evacuation orders can be lifted. The survey conducted last October shows areas exceeding the target level were getting smaller. 
Researchers say decontamination efforts and radioactive cesium sinking deeper into the soil contributed to the reduction. Ongoing decontamination work is expected to further reduce radiation As reconstruction levels. continues, Japan's cabinet has approved a new five-year plan for rebuilding disaster-hit areas. It'll start in April and combined with the old plan cost $280 billion. The new plan says reconstruction efforts in the disaster-hit areas are entering a new phase as public housing construction for survivors is almost finished and businesses have been steadily recovering. And it says it aims to help make the communities self-sustainable and a model for others. It also says the government will aim to make the 2020 Tokyo Olympics and Paralympics the Games of Recovery. They will showcase the areas to the world in part by having some of the torch relay run through there. The plan says the government will continue to play a leading role in recovery efforts in Fukushima Prefecture. The government intends to lift all evacuation orders for municipalities near the nuclear plant by the end of next March, with the exception of areas with the highest levels of radioactive An contamination. The survey shows efforts to rebuild houses in three prefectures are proceeding slowly. NHK assessed projects in dozens of municipalities in Iwate, Miyagi, and Fukushima prefectures. It found fewer than half of the 44,000 odd houses due for construction are ready. Local authorities have promised more than 24,000 public housing units. They've completed just over half. And developers have finished barely a third of roughly 20,000 new private homes. Municipal officials blame the delay on drawn-out negotiations with landowners. Japanese researchers have been analyzing the tsunami that devastated parts of the Northeast five years ago. And they've discovered why the waves were so destructive. A warning, though, this story contains content that may be disturbing to some viewers. The first tsunami swept away sand from beaches and the seabed, vastly changing the landform. It reduced the coast's resistance, allowing successive waves to engulf the area faster. Dikuzen Takata City in Iwate Prefecture used to be lined with beaches, but the waves stripped away the sand and the beaches disappeared. A group at Tohoku University used a supercomputer to simulate the impact of landform changes. Their simulations show that a deadly tsunami reached the city center about 30 seconds faster than under usual conditions. The area was flooded by walls of water as high as 13 meters. That's one meter higher than what would have been expected if sand and mud had blocked the tsunamis. The simulations also show that the second wave came twice as fast, sweeping buildings and cars into the sea. We were able to analyze the effects of the massive tsunami using scientific data and simulations for the first time and clarified various aspects of the disaster. Imamura says authorities must heed his group's findings when preparing for such disasters. People in Japan are preparing to mark five years since an earthquake, tsunami and nuclear accident that devastated the Tohoku region. Authorities have been working to decontaminate the area, but they say there's still some way to go. Officials with Japan's environment ministries say they've been working to remove contamination in eight prefectures. They say they've finished or almost finished the job in nearly two-thirds of the municipalities. The bulk of the remaining decontamination work is in Fukushima prefecture. Authorities say only 14 of the 43 municipalities there have been decontaminated. Ministry officials say the work has been delayed as they search for places to store the radioactive waste. But they are hiring more workers in an effort to speed things up. They say they hope to finish work everywhere outside Fukushima by next March. On March 11, 2011, a massive earthquake and tsunami hit northeastern Japan. It triggered one of the worst nuclear accidents in history at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. This week, our series Journey from Disaster is looking at the region and its people five years on. The nuclear accident at Fukushima forced many nearby residents from their homes. For years, they eagerly awaited the day when they could return. But quite a few of them 
have decided to abandon that dream and try to build new lives elsewhere. NHK World's Kazuaki Hirama has the story. The town of Namie is about six kilometers from Fukushima Daiichi. Work to decontaminate the fields continues. Some roads remain closed. There are many areas where decontamination work has not yet started. 62-year-old Mitsuaki Okura lived in Namie before the accident. This month, Okura visited his hometown for the first time in four months. An evacuation order is still in effect for the entire town. Former residents are only allowed to visit during the day. I can't help looking around to look for my old friends and neighbors, but there's really no one here. Okura used to run a grocery store. For the first couple of years after the accident, he expected he'd go home soon. Government officials say the evacuation order for Okura's neighborhood will be lifted next year. On the one hand, I want to come back, but on the other hand, I know I can't. Everybody feels torn. Okura now lives in Tokyo, where he has no friends. He and his wife share a two-room apartment room which the government provides. Officials have notified Okura and the other evacuees that they will lose their housing assistance by the end of March 2017. I have to think about renting an apartment room on my own. I must start preparing to move out as soon as I can. Okura is left with two choices, go home to Namie or find new lodgings somewhere else. Can he go back to Namie? He asked other Fukushima evacuees he met in Tokyo for advice. Many have cited the lack of medical and other services and the difficulties that still lie ahead as reasons not to go back. After hearing fellow evacuees share their honest feelings, Okura was convinced he can no longer go back. He paid one last visit to his former home to say goodbye to his house and store, both filled with memories. He got rid of the objects he had left behind, including furniture and equipment from the grocery store. He wanted to convince himself that he was doing the right thing. But still, there were items he could not part with precious photo albums that record a vanished, happier life. It really is disappointing, but I don't have much choice. I can't live here all by myself. I'm going to dispose of things in the house and think about how to restart from scratch. People who were forced to leave Fukushima had to build new lives in far-flung locations. Now many of them are finding it difficult to uproot themselves once again and return to the places they once called home. Kazuaki Hirama, NHK World, Namie, Fukushima. A court in central Japan has ordered a utility company to suspend the operations of two nuclear reactors. The decision is the first of its kind affecting reactors that are online. The residents had filed for the court injunction in January of last year. They said reactors number three and number four at the Takama power plant are not safe enough. Otsu District Court ruled that the operator of the plant has not given a sufficient explanation about how to prevent or deal with accidents. It noted that the operator's safety measures are based on an estimation of the maximum possible tremor from only the past 14 earthquakes. 
It said that method is not irrefutably scientific. The two reactors were restarted this year after clearing new, stricter regulations the government introduced after the Fukushima accident. The court injunction takes effect immediately. I'm thrilled. I'm absolutely overwhelmed. We managed to convey to the court just how passionately we feel about this issue. Officials with the plant operator Kansai Electric Power Company issued a statement. They said it's regrettable that the court failed to understand their arguments. They described the injunction as totally unacceptable and said they'll move quickly to appeal. The officials said in the meantime they'll start the process to shut down the number three reactor on Thursday morning. They said it will be fully offline within 10 hours. The number four reactor is already offline. Japan's top government spokesperson said Tokyo is keeping a close eye on the developments. Independent regulators spent a lot of time assessing the reactors at the Takahama plant. They judged that the reactors satisfied the world's toughest standards. The government respects this decision, and it will keep working to put reactors back online.